Hey crew, it's Ben, and we're back with some more Soul Crates. Today we are going to be diving back into Book 7. This is a reading of yesterday we did Plato's Cave, and we're going to see where we get led to today. We are halfway through, so let's dive in where we left off. Let us fall back then, said I, since we did not pick the subject that comes next after geometry correctly just now. How did we go wrong, he asked. After flat surfaces, I said, we took solids already in rotation before taking solids just by themselves. The correct sequence is to take the third dimension after the second, and this is presumably the dimension associated with cubes and whatever has depth. Quite so, Socrates, he said, but these do not seem to have been found yet. Yes, said I, for two reasons. Firstly, because... No city affords them proper respect. These matters, being so difficult, are not thoroughly investigated. Secondly, investigators in this area need a guide, without whom they will not discover anything. But a guide is hard to find in the first place, and when found, as matters now stand, the arrogant fellows who could be able to investigate this would pay no heed to him. But if an entire city were to cooperate with the guide by treating these matters with respect, these people would heed him, and under close and intensive investigation, the true state of affairs would become evident. Even now, although they are disrespected and criticized by most people, and by those who investigate them without being able to explain their usefulness, nevertheless, in the face of all this, they develop by force due to their inherent charm, and it would be no surprise if they were to come to light. Yes, indeed, said he, they do possess exceptional charm. But explain, <clears throat> but explain what you are saying more clearly, for I presume you designated the study of flat surfaces as geometry. Yes, said I. Then, said he, initially you put astronomy after that, but later you changed your mind. Yes, said I, in my haste to, in my haste to recount everything quickly, I am making slower progress. For although the study of dimension of depth is next in sequence, I passed over this because of the comical state of the investigation. And after geometry, I spoke of astronomy, which is the motion of objects with depth. Right, said he. Then, provided the city pursues it, let us propose astronomy as the fourth subject, on the assumption that the third, the one we are now passing over, exists. Quite likely, said he, and I will now praise astronomy, Socrates, in the way you said about it, and avoid the commonplace manner of praise for which you, you rebuked me. Indeed, it is obvious to everyone that this study compels the soul to look upwards and leads it away from what is here to what is there above. This is probably obvious to everyone except me, said I, since that is not how it seems to me. How does it seem to you, he asked, handled as it is nowadays by those who are elevating us towards philosophy, it really makes the soul look downwards. How do you mean, he asked. <clears throat> I think you have a very liberal understanding of the subject concerned with the upper realm. Indeed, if someone were to throw his head back and contemplate the dormants on the ceiling and arrive at some understanding, you would probably think he was contemplating them with his intellect rather than his eyes. Now, perhaps your thinking is sound, and I am being simple-minded, for I cannot think of anything that makes the soul look to the upper realm except the subject that is concerned with what is and the unseen. Whether someone attempts to understand sense objects by gaping upwards or squinting downwards, I would never maintain that he has ever understood anything. For things of this sort do not admit to knowledge, and his soul is not gazing upwards, but downwards, even if he tries to understand while floating on his back on land or in the sea. <clears throat> I am getting my just desserts, said he, and you are right to rebuke me. But in what way are you saying astronomy should be studied, contrary to the way they study it nowadays? If study is to confer the benefits we are speaking of. As follows, said I. 
These adornments that are in the heavens adorn in the visible realm, and although they should be regarded as the most beautiful and perfect of visible objects, they do fall short of true adornments. The motions with which actual speed and actual slowness are moved with respect to one another. In the true number, and in all the true shapes, carrying whatever they contain. These can be apprehended by reason and by thought, but not by sight, or do you think otherwise? Not at all, he replied. Therefore, said I, we must use the heavenly adornments as patterns in order to understand what is unseen, just as if we had come across diagrams, exceptionally well drawn and executed by daily, the dailyists, or some other craftsman or draftsman. Or, for anyone experienced in geometry, on seeing this sort of thing, would surely think that, although the workmanship is very beautiful, it would be quite ridiculous to scrutinize them seriously, with a view to finding the truth about equals, or doubles, or any other proportion in these. Yes, it, it must be ridiculous, said he. <clears throat> Do you not think, then, I asked, that... The genuine astronomer will come to the same conclusion when he looks upon the motions of the stars. Will he not be of opinion that these, and whatever they contain, have been fashioned in the most beautiful manner possible for objects of this sort, by the craftsmen of heaven? But what about the proportion of night to day, and these to the month, of the month to the year, and of the other stars to these, and to one another? Well, do you not believe the true astronomer will think it strange if anyone regards these as unchanging and as undergoing no alteration whatsoever, even though they are physical objects and are visible? And if someone seeks in various ways to grasp the truth about these? Well, I think so now, at any rate, said he, now that I hear you saying so. So... We should engage in astronomy by making use of problems, just as we do in geometry, and bid farewell to the heavenly bodies, if we are actually going to engage in astronomy, so as to make the intelligence that is naturally present in the soul useful rather than useless. You are prescribing a task, said he, that is very much larger than what astronomy deals with nowadays. I think, said I, that our other prescriptions will be of the same sort if we were to use any of the lawgivers. But anyway, do you have any other appropriate subject to suggest? I do not have any, said he, not immediately at any rate. Well, motion, in my opinion, does not consist of one form only, but of many now, a wise man could perhaps list them all, but two are evident even to us. What are they? Besides this one, astronomy, there is a counterpart of this. Which is? It is quite likely, said I, that just as the eyes have been framed for astronomy, so too were the ears framed for harmonic motion, and that these two branches of knowledge are kindred to one another, as the Pythagoreans maintain. And... Are we agreeing with them, Glaucon? Is that what we are doing? Just so, he replied. Therefore, since this is a considerable task, we shall find out from them what they have to say on these matters, and whether there is anything else besides these. But throughout the entire process, we shall guard our own concern, which is that our charges should never attempt to learn anything incomplete. Anything that does not con consistently reach the point which everything needs to reach, a failing we ascribed earlier to astronomy. Or do you not know that in the case of harmony, too, the practitioners do something similar? Indeed, they, for their part, measure the concords and sounds that are heard one against another, engaging in useless labor, just like the astronomers. Yes, by the guy, said he, and they call some intervals dense bending their ears towards them as if they were eavesdropping on their neighbors, and some declaring that they still hear a note in between, and that this is the smallest interval by which we should measure, while others dispute this and say it is the same as the note already sounding, 
both parties grant their ears priority over their intelligence. It's funny, they're actually listening to wavelengths with no way to measure it, right? You are referring, said I, to the good fellows who inflict trouble upon the strings and torture them by tightening them on the pegs. <clears throat> but in case this image gets out of hand, I will put a stop to it now, before it refers to the strings being beaten with the plectrum, the various accusations against them and their reluctance and, or readiness to answer. These are not the people I am referring to, but the others. Those we said just now we would ask about harmony. Indeed, those these fellows do the same thing as those who were involved in astronomy, since they are looking for numbers in the concords that they can hear, and they do not ascend to the levels of problems, and investigate which numbers are concordant, which are not, and the reason why this is so. The task you are describing, he said, he is not of this world. Well, it is useful if it is done in search of the beautiful and the good, otherwise it is useless. Quite likely, said he. And I think that if the method we have described for all of these subjects get to their kinship and what they have in common and works out their mutual affinities, then their pursuit does contribute something to our desired ends and not to and is not unprofitable, otherwise it is pointless. And I feel the and I feel the same way, Socrates, said he, but you are describing an enormous undertaking. Are you speaking of the prelude, or what? Or do we not know that these are all a prelude to the main thing, the one that we must learn? For surely you do not think that those who are clever in these subjects are skilled in dialectic. By Zeus, I do not, he said. Apart from a few exceptions, I have come across. Well then, do you not think those who are unable to present an argument and respond to one will ever know anything of what they, what we say they must know? In that case, too, he said, the answer is no. Glaucon, is not this at last the main thing, the very one that dialectic performs? And though, although it is known by reason, it would imitate the power of sight that we described in our earlier image, which at certain stages tries to look at the actual living creatures, then at the stars themselves, and finally at the sun itself. And whenever someone attempts in this way, by dialectic, without any of the senses, to get to what each thing itself is, through reason, and does not give up until he apprehends what the good itself is, by the reasoning process itself, he then arrives at the end of the realm known by reason, just as the other man in our allegory came to the end of the visible realm. Entirely so, said he. Yes, and do you not refer to this process as dialectical? Indeed. And what about the release of the prisoner from his bonds, his turning from the shadows to the images that cast them, and to the light, the ascent from underground into the sunlight, and his inability when he gets there to look yet at the actual animals and plants and the lights of the sun, and is looking instead at the divine appearances in water? or its shadows of things that are, rather than the shadows of images, cast by another such light, which, when compared to the sun, is like another shadow. All this practice of the subjects we have described has this power, and leads what is best in the soul upwards to the sight of what is most excellent among the things that are. Just as in our allegory, what is brightest in the body was led upwards towards the sight of what is most resplendent in the realm of the physical and the visible. I accept that this is so, and yet, although I find it extremely difficult to accept, in another way it is not difficult to. Nevertheless, this needs to be heard often, not only today but in the future, so we should return to this. But, let us assume for now that what has been proposed is indeed so, and then proceed to the main theme itself and go through it in detail, just as we did with the prelude. So tell me, what is the manner of this power of dialectic? What, is, what sort of forms is it divided into? And what paths does it follow? For these would be the ones that lead at last to where there is, and for whoever goes there, a sort of rest from the journey and an end to the process.
<clears throat> Dear Glaucon, you would not be able to follow me even longer, even though there will not be any eager, lack of eagerness on my part. Nor will you still be seeing an image of what we are speaking of, but the truth itself, as it appears to me anyway. At the moment, it is not right to insist that this is actually so or that is not, but we should insist that there is something of this sort to be seen. Is this so? Of course. And should we also, also not also insist that the power of the dialectic alone would reveal this to someone with experience in what we have been describing just now, is that this is not possible in any other way. It is only right, said he, that we insist upon this too. Well, said I, no one will argue against us when we say that some other method, apart from the five subjects, attempts to grab systemically, in each case, each and every case, what each itself is. But all the other skills are concerning, concerned with people's opinions and desires, or with producing things and assembling them, or with looking after them once they have been produced or assembled. As for the rest, geometry and so on, we maintain that these apprehended something of what is. But we see, but we see that although they dream about what is, they are unable to see it wide awake, as long as they make use of hypotheses that are left unchallenged because they are unable to give an account of them. For when the first principle is something that is not known and the conclusion of everything in between is woven from what is not known, is there any way that a combination like this would ever constitute knowledge? None at all, said he. Does not the dialectical method alone proceed in a way to the first principle itself? by doing away with the hypothesis in order to be sure of its ground. It draws the eye of the soul, which is actually buried in some outlandish mire, and leads her upward, using the very subjects we have described as helpmates and assistants in this conversation. We have often referred to these subjects as branches of knowledge out of habit, but they need another name to indicate greater clarity than opinion, and more vagueness than knowledge. I think we used understanding to make the distinction earlier, but in my opinion there is no point in arguing over a name when an inquiry into such an important matter lies before us. No indeed, he replied. So, said I, <clears throat> are you content to do what we did before? To call the first part knowledge, the second understanding, the third belief, and the fourth imagination. The last two, both together, constitute opinion, and the first two, intelligence. Opinion is concerned with becoming, while intelligence is concerned with being. And that, and as being is becoming so, is as, and as being is to becoming, so is intelligence to opinion. And as intelligence is to opinion, so is the knowledge to belief and understanding to imagination. But the proportion between what these two are directed towards Glaucon and the twofold division of each of these, what is grasped by opinion and what is grasped by intelligence, this we should leave aside in case we get involved in many times before arguments that we have already been through. Well, said he, in so far as I am able to follow, I agree with you about the other. And do you describe someone who account, acquires an account of the being of each, uh, the being of each thing, as dialectical? And would you not say that someone who cannot do, insofar as he in a, is unable to give an account, either to himself or anyone else, lacks intelligence about the thing to that extent? How could I say otherwise, he replied. Does not the same apply to the good? If... Someone is not able to separate the form of the good by argument, setting it apart from everything else, going through all the refutations like a warrior, eager to practice refutation based upon being rather than opinion, and coming through all of this with his argument still standing. You will say, will you not, that someone who cannot do this does not know the good itself, nor any other good either. And if he does, 
somehow, get hold of some image of the good. He does so by opinion and not by knowledge. He is dreaming and sleeping his life away. And before he ever wakes up here, he finally he arrives finally in Hades and sleeps on forever. Is this not what you would say? Yes, by Zeus, and I'd say all that, very much so. But of course, in the case of your own children, whom you are bringing up and educating in our discussion, if, if you were ever actually bringing them up, I presume you would not allow them to be irrational, like lines and geometry, when ruling the city and presiding over matters of the utmost importance. Indeed not. Then you will pass a law by which they will receive an education that enables them, above all, to ask and answer questions in the most knowledgeable manner possible. We shall indeed, he said, with your help. In that case, said I, do you think we now have a dialectic positioned above other subjects, like a coping stone, that no other subject may rightly be placed higher, and that our discussion of the various subjects is now complete? <clears throat> I do indeed. Well, your remaining task is their distribution, and deciding to whom we shall allocate these subjects, and in what way. Of course, said he. Do you remember the kind of people we chose when we selected our rulers earlier? How could I forget? Well, in general, those very natures are the ones that must be selected. The most steadfast and bravest should be chosen, and as far as possible, the most comely. As well as this, we must look not only for those who are noble and virile in character, but they should also have the natural qualities that suited to this particular education. What qualities? They need to be keen, my friend, on the subjects they learn, and have no difficulty in understanding them. Indeed, men's souls are much more inclined to run, turn coward in the face of demanding studies than in the gymnasium, since the exertion is much more personal to themselves because it is private and not shared with the body. True. Well, we should look for a good memory, robustness, and a total love of hard work. Or how else do you think anyone would be prepared to undertake physical labor and also complete so much study and practice? No one would, said he, not unless he was extraordinarily gifted by nature. Our current problem, said I, and the associated disrespect for philosophy has come about because, as I said before, those who take to philosophy are unworthy of it. What philosophy needs are genuine adherence and not fakes. In what way? Firstly, someone who takes to philosophy should not be handicapped in his love of hard work, so that he loves half the work and does not bother with the other half. This happens when someone loves exercise and loves hunting, and loves all physical labor, but is not a lover of learning, does not like to listen, has no spirit of inquiry, and hates any work that involves any of these. And when the situation is reversed, the man's love of labor is handicapped in the opposite way. Very true, said he. And will we not suggest that a soul is maimed in relation to truth in the same way if it hates the deliberate lie, finds it unbearable in itself, and gets extremely angry when lied to by others, and yet calmly accepts the unintentional lie, is untroubled by the lack of understanding when caught out somehow and has no qualms about being debased in ignorance like some swinish beast. Yes, entirely so, said he. And when it comes to sound-mindedness, courage, magnanimity, and all the other parts of excellence, must we not be on our guard just as much to distinguish between the genuine and the fake? For whenever a city or an individual does not know how to look at things like this comprehensively, they unwittingly rely on fakes, and those whose work is handicapped, as their allies or rulers in this case may be. That is what happens, said he, very much so. Then we should be extremely careful about everything of this sort, said I, because if we introduce sensible people, sound of body, to such extensive study and exercise, and educate them, justice herself will no find no fault with us and we shall save our city and its form of government. But 
If we introduce people of the wrong sort to these studies, we shall achieve the complete opposite and deluge philosophy with even more ridicule. That indeed, said he, would be shameful. It certainly would. But at the moment, I too seem to be inviting ridicule. How so? I forgot that we were just playing, and I spoke with too much intensity. For as I was speaking, I turned my gaze towards philosophy, and seeing it being trampled undeservedly in the mire, I went into a rage and said what I said too seriously, as though I were angry with those responsible. By Zeus, no, that is not how it sounded to me as I listened. Well, that is how it sounded to me as I said it. But we must not forget that in the previous selection process, we picked old men. But in this case, that is not allowed. Indeed, we should not believe so long that a person is able to learn a lot in old age. He can no more learn than run a race. No, all great labors, and there are many, belong to the young. They must, said he. I disagree, because I'm getting old. Now, calculation, geometry, and the preliminary instruction that should precede education in dialectic needs to be set before them when they are still children, without presenting it in the form of compulsory instruction that they must learn. Why not? Because a free man should never learn any subject under conditions of slavery. Indeed, Physical labors performed under compulsion do not make the body any worse, but no instruction forcibly imparted is retained by the soul. True. So, my friend, as you bring up the children in these various subjects, do not do it forcibly but playfully, so that you will be able to better discern what each of them is naturally adapted to. That sounds reasonable, said he. Do you not remember that assuming it was safe to do so, we also maintained that the children should be brought to the battlefields on horseback as spectators and brought close to the fray to get a taste of blood like young hunting dogs? I remember. And in all these exertions, studies, and dangers, whoever should pr prove consistently to be the most adept is to be admitted to a select number. At what age? at the time when their compulsory gymnastics comes to an inch. End. For during that period of about two or three years, it is impossible to undertake anything else, since tiredness and sleep are inimical to study. And at the same time, their prowess in gymnastics is, in itself, one of their most important tests. Yes, said he, it would, need, it would have to be. And when this period is over, those 20-year-olds who have been selected will have to bring the subjects they were presented unsystemically during their childhood education into a combined view of the interrelatedness of the subjects with one another and with the nature of what is. Yes, said he, only this sort of learning becomes steadfast in those who receive it. And this is the greatest test of whether their natures are dialectical or not. Someone who can take a combined view is dialectical, while someone who cannot do so is not. I concur. Well, you will need to consider all of this. Those among our young folks who are most like these people and are also reliable in their studies in war and in their other appointed duties, these again, once they reach 30, should be selected from among the previous selection and awarded even greater honor. You should then see testing them by the power of dialectic, who is able to let go, let go the eyes and other senses, and proceed in the company of truth to what just is. And here, my friends, the task requires the utmost care. Why exactly? Are you not aware of how much harm is done by the dialectic as practiced nowadays? What sort of harm? Its practitioners are filled with lawlessness. Very much so. Now, do you think it is any surprise that this happens to them? And do you not sympathize with them? In what way exactly? Suppose that a changeling child was brought up amidst great wealth, in a large and extensive family followed, surrounded by lots of flatterers. 
what if he became aware as a grown man that he was not related to these so-called parents and was unable to find his real parents? Can you guess what his attitude would be towards those flatterers and the substitute parents? Either during the time when he did not know about the switch or later when he did know. What would you like to hear my guess? I would like that, he said he. Well, my guess is that during the time when he did not know the truth, he would honor his father and mother and his supposed family members. More than those who flatter him, he would be less inclined to allow them to want for anything or to do or say anything unlawful to them and more inclined to be persuaded by them rather than by the flatterers on important matters, quite likely. But once he had become aware of the actual situation, my guess is that, in contrast, he would lose his honor and respect for them, intensify his respect for the flatterers, and be persuaded by them to a greater extent than before. He would then live as they do, associate openly with them, and pay no heed to that pretended father and the rest of his pretended relatives, until he was extremely reasonable by nature. Everything you are describing is the sort of thing that would actually happen. But what relevance does this image have for those who are encountering dialectic? It is as follows. There are, I presume, certain doctrines about what is just and beautiful that we have from childhood. Doctrines they have been brought up on. So we grant them authority and honor them like parents. There are indeed. <clears throat> And there are pursuits opposed to these doctrines, pursuits that involve pleasure, which flatter their soul of ours and drag her in their direction. However, these do not sway people who have some element of measure, who continue to honor the traditional doctrines and grant them authority. That is right. What about this? Suppose there comes a time when someone in such a situation is faced with a question and asked, what is the beautiful? And he gives the answer he heard from the conventional source, but the argument refutes this. Suppose it refutes him many times in lots of different ways and reduces him to the opinion that it is no more beautiful than it is ugly. And the same thing happens with the just, the good, and whatever is held in the highest esteem. How do you think he will behave after this towards those doctrines? in terms of honor in granting them authority. Inevitably, he will no longer honor them in the same way or be persuaded by them either. Now, when he regards those doctrines as no longer worthy of the honor he gave them before and has no affinity with them, but cannot recover the true ones, is he likely to have recourse to any other life besides the flatterer's life? No, he is not. In that case, I think, he will seem to have become lawless, and having previously been law-abiding, he must. Is this not the likely predicament of those who encounter dialectic in this way and who, as I said early, earlier, deserve a lot of sympathy? Yes, and pity too. Well, you should be careful with every detail of their encounter with di di dialectic so that there is no need to pity your 30-year-old students. Very much so. So, there is one thing to be extremely careful about, is there not? That they do not get a taste of this when they are still young. For I presume you have noticed that youngsters, when they first get a taste of dialectic, misuse it as if it was their plaything. By using it always to come up with counter-arguments, they themselves imitate those who engage in refutation by refuting other people, taking delight like puppies in verbally tugging at and pulling apart anyone who ever comes near them. Exceedingly so. And so, when they themselves have refuted many and have been refuted by many, they descend rapidly and inexorably into a state where they believe nothing they believed before. And as a consequence, they themselves and philosophy in general, are held in low regard by everyone else. Very true. But someone older, said I, would not want to be involved in such madness. 
He will imitate the one who is in, willing to engage in dialectic and consider the truth rather than the one who plays with it for fun or just argues against people. And he himself will be more measured and will bring honor to this activity rather than dishonor. That is right. Now, was not everything that was said previous to this said as a caution that dialectic is to be imparted to the orderly and stable natures and not as is done that nowadays to anyone at all even if they are unsuited yes certainly <clears throat> is it enough then to persist with the practice of dialectic continuously and intensively without any involvement in anything else as a mental counterpart of the bodily exercises they practiced for twice as many years as that. Do you mean six years or four, he asked. It does not matter, said I. Let us suggest five. After this, they will be brought down again into that cave and compelled to rule over military matters and take up other positions of authority suited to the young so that they do not lag behind the others in experience. And in these situations, too, they will be tested to see if they hold firm or shift their ground when they are being dragged in all directions. How much time are you proposing for this? Fifteen years, said I. And when they have turned fifty, those who have come through safely and have excelled in every way at everything, in action and in knowledge, should be led at that stage to the final destination. They should be compelled to lift the ray of the soul upwards, to behold that which provides light to everything and seeing the good itself and using that as their pattern, bring order to the city, its citizens and themselves for the rest of their lives. Each in turn should spend most of their time in philosophy, but when their turn comes, they should get involved in the drudgery of civic affairs, each exercising authority for the sake of the city not doing so, not as some fine activity, but as a necessity. And having continually educated others in this way, others who are like themselves, and having left behind these as guardians of the city, they themselves depart to the blessed isles to dwell there. And the city should have memorials to them and offer sacrifices publicly as if to demigods. If the Pythia consents, and if not, as to blessed or divine personages. You are like a sculptor, Socrates, fashioning rulers who are absolutely beautiful. Female rulers, too, said I, do not presume that what I have said applies any more to men than it does to those women among their number who are naturally equipped for the role. You are right. If they really are to share everything equally with the men, as we have explained. <clears throat> well then, do you agree that what we have said about the city and its system of government has not been a mere aspiration? Rather, although it is difficult to, it is still possible, but only in the way we have described. Whenever true philosophers, many or just one, come to power in the city, despite the honors of the age which they regard as unworthy of free men, and attach more importance to what is right and to the honors that come from that and treat justice as supreme and absolutely necessary. Then by serving this and strengthening this, they will set their own city in order. How? They will send anyone in the city who happens to be more than 10 years old out into the countryside. They will then isolate the children from their present habits and habits of their parents and Bring them up in their own manners and regulations, the sort we described. And once the city and form of government we are speaking of has been established, very quickly and easily, in that way, do you not agree that it will be a happy city? And that people among whom it arises will be a benefit enormously? Very much so. And I think, Socrates, what you have described nicely is how it might come into existence, if it were ever to do so. At this stage, said I, have we not had our fill of arguments about the city and the sort of person who resembles it? For surely it is also obvious what sort of person we shall say he must be. 
it is obvious. And as for your question, I think that is the end of the matter. And that is where we are going to end book seven. I believe there are a couple more books, but hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a not too difficult topic, right? There wasn't a whole lot for me to add, right? I added the parts I felt like I needed to, but there wasn't a whole lot for me to add to this. This is the argument about arguments. What makes a good argument? And when are you able to understand what an argument is, right? We have the same problems today that they had then. People using the arguments at the detriment of the citizenry. That is a very, very prevalent thing today. We have people who are entering not for service and for justice, but for self-aggrandizement and to receive the honors of being a senator or a congressman or a president or whatever the case may happen to be. And so we don't have statesmen in the way that it's described here at all, as far as I can tell. There are a couple of men out there who are standing firmly where they believe, and that is the best we can hope for, I guess. But I do not really see people trying to see both sides of the argument at all. I see people who lean heavily into their side and disregard the other side completely, and that is not correct. Right? That is not the proper way to do things. This is an eye-opening experience for me. This reading it aloud really sets it at home inside of you, so you should definitely check it out. The link is provided down below. Go back and reread these things and place the emphasis in different parts and read it as though it's an actual conversation that you are having. And It really helps to cement it in my mind, the way that my stack is ordered at the very least, a lot of these principles, like I already held most of this and I've worked out most of this on my own. So it's not like it's a lot of surprises, but it is interesting to see it arrayed in this manner, laid out so that you can just absorb it. And this dialectic conversation that we're having is important, but we need to make sure that we are operating actually on facts and not suppositions and not opinion rather than knowledge. This is an important one today. I hope y'all stuck around. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt State. Peace.